Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Jim K. Ford Sends Nation podcast. It's been a while. I'm actually getting most of the time we, we record frequently enough where I think people are, you know, satisfied with the amount of Steve and Greg they're getting. Uh, but uh, I've actually got a few emails. I've gotten a few uh, posts on social media. Oh. What's going on with the show? Uh, I'll follow my sword for that one right out of the gate. It's been 10 days. Apologies for that uh, life getting in the way a little bit. But uh, yeah, five games have happened for the Ottawa Senators. And they're on a pretty good jag right now. So we'll get into all of the things that have happened since we last got together. Maybe not the stuff that's really old, but uh, there has been a lot happening here in the last little bit. It's Steve and Greg once again. Greg, how are you today? Good, Steve. It's a, it's a, it's late on a Sunday afternoon. It's been a nice, uh, relaxing Sunday for me. I hope it has been for you. I know you've had a little bit of stress going through, going on in your life, but I hope you're okay. You're good to go for uh, 40 minutes or so here. Yeah, I am. Absolutely. A lost cell phone. What's more fun than a lost cell phone? But it's helping me today that uh, TSN 1200 Ottawa Senators pregame show host Graham Creech is absolutely absorbing a fantasy football beatdown from me this afternoon. So <laughs> okay, cheering me up a little bit because Creech, by the way, he's uh, when he's going good, like he won it for two years in a row one time. Uh, he actually named his team like two-time champion, right? So he's very, very cocky. So I don't mind kicking him yeah. when he's down. But let's get into the Sens talk. <laughs> there is a lot to, to discuss. And I think the biggest thing is however, how good everybody's feeling over the last couple of games. They played the last two. Let's address those first. They lose to Igor Shosturkin, not the New York Rangers, just Shosturkin in New York on Friday night, 2-1. to one. And then an equally good performance just 24 hours later in an ambush game when you've got Seattle in Ottawa waiting for the boys. 24 hours later, the Sens come back home and they beat Seattle by a count of 3 nothing. You're probably feeling, feeling pretty good about the way the team's playing right now. Yeah, I, I, especially the Seattle game, Steve. I, I agree with you, the Ranger game. That's the thing. They played five games, and in that time, they only won two. Uh, five games since right. we've been together. They only won two, but could have just as easily won all five. Uh, I thought the Ranger game was great, but that Seattle game, that's... Uh, Ambush is the right word. That's got everything written all over it for an easy game to lose. You're you're playing one night and your your opponent is sitting in your town waiting for you to come home and just destroy you the next night. And they can't, that might have been their best sixty minutes all season. The game against Seattle, uh, even even including the game against St. Louis, I thought the game against Seattle was even better. Uh, just a solid effort right from the get go. And a three nothing victory. It was a really good game, and and a, and a joy to watch too. I thought a really good game. Yeah, I like those games where the Sens never really feel like their lead is in jeopardy. They just kind of lock things down, uh, goal in every period, and uh, just never felt like that game was in doubt to me. Even though it wasn't the blowout, you know, of say the eight one win over St. Louis three games ago. And Anton Forsberg's a great story. He's had uh, his last. Uh, in the last three games, he's got two shutouts. And, uh, you know, is, is he doing anything differently in your mind, or is this just a team playing better in front of Forsberg? I, I think that's the main thing. The team's playing much better in front of him. Um, and, and I wonder if, if it's also a little bit of a psych thing. Uh, you know, he kind of he, he has the confidence of the coaching staff, I think, after the bit of a, a dropped ball. Uh, by uh, Allmark in the one game of the road trip there where they, 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 you think they would have come back with Allmark the next day. They didn't. They came out with Forsberg. So kind of saying, hey, you know, Ollie didn't do so well, so we're going with you for this one. And he showed up, and he showed up ever since. I think the fact that he's got some confidence in him, the fact that he played games when Allmark was injured and played well, I think it's all helped him uh, psychologically, confidence-wise, that he's a better goaltender now. Um, and and not allowing that one bad goal every game that we know that he seems to do, and just uh, having success with the, the the team in front of him and and helping contributing to the win. You know, it's 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 not like they would have lost the game without him, but uh, but contributing to the win in a way that that's uh, valuable to him and helps his confidence. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's all the above uh, in in terms of deciding why. You know, is it is it because the team's playing better in front of him? Is he just better? I'd also even throw in the influence of Linus Allmark. I mean, mm -hmm. Allmark seems like a guy who is you know, full of confidence. He's got the contract now. He's set for life, many lives. Uh, and I think he's he's just generous with his time. And I, I wonder if he's been a good influence. I do know if you're into gear, there's a website called geargeek.com. And it tracks 
what every player is using for their equipment, what brand name they're using. And it even makes reference to when goal, you know, goalies and players change what they're using. And I found it interesting that uh, right out of the gate at the start of the season, you had Anton Forsberg deciding to change sticks to go exactly with the model that Linus Olmark is using. So those guys have known each other for a very long time. So I wouldn't write off the fact that maybe Olmark is you know, acting as a pseudo teacher, not a teacher. That's probably a bit extreme, but giving him some really good tips. Yeah. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think Olmark's younger, isn't he? <laughs> no, no, he wouldn't be younger, but they're, they're very close. They're around the same age. I think they came up together. Yeah. So it's not like one's really a father it's a, or even big brother, little no. brother. It's just that they're, they're countrymen. They have, they've have experience playing uh, together, growing up together against each other over the years. And yeah, I think that, it, it, when the, when a better goalie comes to town, like a really good goalie, it, it, I, I don't think age matters. It's uh, it's his pedigree that matters that allows him to be the 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 protege, the, the mentor versus the protege. Really, it's his record, it's his stats line that makes him turns him into the mentor and takes somebody under his wing. And yeah, I, I I would agree with you. His his influence has probably had something a lot to do with with Forsberg's play as well. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking age, if you and I want to take up the position of goaltender tomorrow, we're way older than both these guys. And I would have no problem saying, yes, that's my teacher. That's my mentor. No problem there at all. So age is definitely uh, no part of it. But I do think the guys are uh, they're obviously not exactly the same age, but they're in the same yeah. ballpark because, again, they they came up uh, around the same time in, in the Swedish program. But, um, yeah, another angle, another thing, another player I wanted to talk about was Adam Gaudet. And talked him up pretty good coming into the, the season, but I didn't expect this. I mean, I was expecting good things because there were so many reasons why, A, he had a good chance to be that 12th forward with all the battling going on at training camp. That really was the only battle at training camp. Who's going to be the 12th forward? And Gaudette, there were a lot of reasons why he had the advantage, the Travis Green factor. He had the uh, you know AHL leading goal scorer. Um, again, he had, he had success back in Vancouver with him and and he's been here before he knows most of the guys on this team a lot of the guys on this team from his first go around with the club but I didn't expect him to come out of the gate uh with uh with six goals in the first I think he's played 10 games he's, he's missed one but uh that's that's a hell of a start for Adam Gaudet and in lieu of you know slow starts uh by so, you know some other guys on the team I mean he's he briefly held the team goal scoring lead in that Seattle game until Brady Kachuk took it back with his seventh goal. But uh, yeah, Gaudet, I think has been no matter what you thought of him coming in, he's been a surprise. Yeah. I, and I, I'll admit coming in, he was not exactly uh, what you would call your stereotypical bottom six or even bottom three guy. He's not a fourth line player. His skill set is offensive player. He's a, he's a Holby right. Baker winner. He's an offensive guy. He led the American league in goal scoring. So it's kind of it's unique in a sense that to, to see a guy of that type of skill set playing on your fourth line uh, and then having success because that's the other thing you see teams do it all the time they call a guy up for the American League who's an offensive guy who's projected to be a top six forward someday but when he gets called up the only place in the lineup for him to play is the fourth line and really the guy accomplishes nothing you know really can't do anything because he doesn't get the opportunities but here's a guy at Adam Gaudet a sniper who's proving to be the, the same goal scorer he's always been. He gets his opportunities. He finishes. He just plain finishes. And it's been uh, it's been a nice bonus because, as you mentioned, there's some guys that have been off to a little bit of a slow start. Most of the other uh, guys that have come in have not put up these kind of stats. You know, Michael Madio or Nick Cousins or Noah Gregor are, are not putting up any kind of offensive numbers. And to have a Godet being the one that is doing it is a big surprise. But uh, but a very welcome surprise. It, it, I think it helps that that the change in the in the way the team forechecks they're they're much more relentless. They stick to the forecheck more. They're much better positioned at F two and F three and cutting off lanes and, and keeping teams trapped in the offensive zone so that they actually eventually end up getting a chance a scoring chance instead of just a one and done off the rush or a a dump sort of going to forecheck and they flipped out and you're out of the zone. You know they they have some sustained offensive zone time and that's when a godhead is going to shine because he gets an opportunity off that extended time in the offensive zone. 
in the lifetime of this podcast, and it began, I don't know, what are we, four years into this? Something like that? Does that sound right? We were pre-pandemic. Yeah. So we, right. we started in 20, yeah. sometime in 19 or 20. Right. So yeah. we've really not seen an Ottawa Senators team since the start of this podcast that has been consistently good. And I think that's the big thing. We've seen them at you know play really, really well for short periods, but that consistency factor... So during those times, when we talk about this team as much as anybody does, you know, when they go well, we get a little too high. When they go badly, we get a little too low, kind of violating our own sort of coaching principles. Never get too high, never get too low. But this is a different deal. We're just talking. We're just talking here. And so my point is, they're in another high point. Everybody's Everybody in town's feeling like, yeah, it feels like they're starting to figure things out. They're, they're doing things the right way out there and that game in New York excellent game they should have won then again they come back 24 hours later another excellent game I'll put the question to you though is this just another case of a blip on the radar where they're going good and we're getting overly excited or do you feel do you have a sense that something's different this time I was going to put the question to you Steve good (laughs) good job Uh, I, I do get a sense that it's different and and the reason it's different or the, the, the what's making me think it's different is the losses haven't been bad, right? Like when it used to be they'd win four or five and look really good, and then they just lay a stinker followed by another stinker and look terrible losing. Whereas here, yes, they lost in, in – sorry, they won in Utah. Yes, they lost in Vegas. Yes, they lost in Denver. But I really thought both of those games, they, they could have won. They were leading both games going into the third period, or maybe in Denver it was tied, but they were definitely leading yeah. in Vegas. You know, I think I thought both of those games was definitely Vegas. My God, they did everything right but win. You know, they, they, they at the very least they deserved a point to lose in overtime. Instead, it's two goals in thirty seconds late in the third. But they played well in the losses, and that's what's different about this team than past teams, or that's what's different about this current stretch than past stretches. Does it continue? I don't know. There may still be a stinker followed by another stinker around the corner this week, but if it continues the way it's continued so far or gone so far, then yeah, they, they've turned a corner for the 1200th time. I'm gonna, we're going to say they turned a corner, Steve, they turned a corner. Um, and I, I think, yeah, things are looking up. This, this team is better much better uh, maturity-wise, systems-wise, tactically speaking, uh, patience, uh, intelligence, uh, discipline. This team is, is, is a lot better. And the guy that's leading them on the ice, Brady Kachuk, seems like he's a new Brady Kachuk. After the game against Seattle, he actually used the term the old me, as in the old me would have tried to go for the empty net goal instead of playing D or something like that. And to me, he looks like a different captain. And maybe it's been brought on by age. Maybe it's been brought on by the success of his brother, Matthew, and being ringside to watch his brother win a Stanley Cup four months ago. That may all be in play. I think it's probably, you know, a combination of everything. But certainly Brady Kachuk looks like a guy who's a different hockey player in terms of his priorities out there. Maybe a little less run and gun and fun maybe a little more captain serious at this stage of the game or as serious as Brady Kachuk can get. But to me, he looks like a captain that has a little more resolve. And I think the biggest thing is he's just an older hockey player. He's He's been stung by all the missed playoffs. He looks like a guy that wouldn't shock me, just basically went into Travis Green's office on day one and said, listen, tell me what I'll ha- what I have to do to get this team to the playoffs and compete for a Stanley Cup. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Yeah. I I have no doubt that a conversation like that took place. And let's not forget the influence of Alfie having been around uh, starting, you know, last season into this season. I think Jacques Martin probably, his presence probably has something to do with this. And then you... You bring in Travis Green, but you also bring in different players in a different system. And now this year, it's kind of everything that's happened over the last two years has all sort of come together here. And you have a new Brady. And I'm sure he had conversations with all of those people, Jacques Martin, Daniel Alvarez, and Travis Green about, okay, what do I personally have to do? 
and not necessarily what do I have to do on the ice? What do I have to do as the captain of this team, as the leader of this ship? What do I have to do to get this team or to help you deliver the message and get this team over the hurdle here? And yeah, he's taking it to heart. The, um, the penalties are down. The fights are down. The the extracurricular stuff is down. He's 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 a man on a mission. You know, he, he comes to the rink with his briefcase and he's he's a, he's going to work. You know, it's a business trip, um, and it, it's it's really nice to see. He's having a really good year. Yeah, you look at his. Uh, it's a good point about the penalties and the fights. Our pal Steve Lloyd, who's been on the show before, uh, made note of this on social media. This is the deepest. Brady Kachuk has ever been into his career without a fight. 11 games in, he's never gone this deep without a fight. And last year, he was second in the entire NHL in penalty minutes. Right now, he's not even in the top, inside the top 70. He has 10 penalty minutes in 11 games by his standards. That's Lady Bing stuff. But <laughs> what I love is he's not, he's, not, he's not sacrificing the bull in the China shop stuff. He's still doing all the things, storming the net, being a pain in the ass to play against and getting his goals, leading the team with seven in 11 games. So he's off to a fantastic start. So that's just another they, example of you know a, a guy that's really trying to do what's required for this team to get to the playoffs and compete for a Stanley Cup. Because like, let's be honest, Greg, we've talked about this. You know, It's great that Brady Kachuk likes to get in fights, but he tends to get suckered in by the Brendan Lemieux of the world, these, these fringe NHL players who get him off the ice for five minutes or more, if he's the instigator or whatever, there's more on top of that, misconducts and things like that. And the opponent absolutely loves when that happens, right? Yeah. And it was, they brought it up on Hockey Night in Canada too, Steve. They had the stats up there and they compared it. They brought up Matthews and Matthew was the same sort of thing over, over a three year period, watching his penalty minutes go down, watching his fights go down. Uh, but you're right. Who, who? It's not necessarily that Brady fought so much, although that is an issue. But it was, yeah, who he was fighting with, and that was sort of yeah. a sign of immaturity, a sign of pick your battles, son. Yeah, the Jacob Truba one. We all remember the Jacob Truba one. That one was okay. There was nothing wrong with that one. Uh, but the the preseason Arbor Arbor Jack guy. I, does 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 it have to be Brady who answers the bell? With Arbor Jack guy, can't can't Zach McEwen or somebody else take care of that issue? It's who you're going to fight. It's the time of game that you're going to fight. It's the score. You know, the situation on the ice is important. And I think those things are now obviously on his mind. And yeah, he's not fighting anymore and not taking penalties anymore. It's just, it's yet another step in the maturation of Brady, Brady Kachuk. Now that I'm in the locker room more, I'm reminded from the early days when I covered every Sens game, I was just, I was young, I was 26 years old, and I was excited to be there. So anything the players had to say, I was like hanging off their every word. With time, you start to go, okay, this is such cliche stuff. It's all the same. One day at a time, yada, yada, yada. And I was kind of, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of that again. Most of, you know, if you do 10 of these scrums, you know, you might get two that are kind of interesting. And one of them happened after the game against the uh, the Seattle Kraken, Brady Kachuk's holding court as he often does, and immediately, not immediately, but somebody asked him the question about, um, you know, a new commitment to defense and 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 leading by example, and that's when uh, Brady Kachuk was at his best with three or four answers. So let me play Brady Kachuk mm -hmm. from after the three nothing win over the Kraken the other night. Timmy talked about kind of making some defensive plays at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. How much emphasis do you have on that kind of leading example for your team, especially on the defensive side? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes kind of hand in hand of, you know, about, you know, old mistakes to new mistakes. I think the old me would have, um, you know, maybe gone for the empty netter. And, and um, but um, I guess it's just showing that there there's a new mentality in this room. There's a new, um, I guess, mindset um I, I guess you can say that so um i think for me it's um in our line timmy especially and, and really it's it's all about leading by example and, and uh um you know if we're doing it right then guys will follow that mindset that you're talking about do you feel like there's a level of hunger in this room to a degree that you haven't seen or time that you've been here 100 percent. yeah i think um um, you kind of nailed it there. It's, I think we're sick of, you know, the continuous cycle that we've been on uh, since we've been here of, of going home early and, and 
you know, should have, could have, would have throughout the whole year. I think for us, it's just, you know, this year's different. This year's mindset's different. That's, um, we want more. We want more from ourselves, uh, each other. And, and, uh, uh, but the great thing about this group is, is the belief that we have in one another. So there is Sens Captain Brady Kachuk, and uh, I mean, that is some serious on-point messaging, the kinds of things you want to hear from your young leader, and I really think that's part of the reason why most of the time it's probably best to stay with the tried and true. When you're naming a captain, it normally goes to an experienced guy who's been around the league a little while. This is the reason why. I think now Brady Kachuk has gone through the the warts of the position, some tough seasons as from a team perspective. It feels to me now, now that he's grown into the captaincy and and he's ready to be really good at it. It's perfect. He's you're right. It, it's influences from a lot of people, right? Uh, all those all those veterans that came through here that didn't do well in the lineup certainly had an effect on him. Yeah, you know, like even a I go back to a Derek Stepan. I, I'm sure Derek Stepan had some conversation with Brady Kachuk. You know, the Claude Giroux has uh, Travis Hamanick's role in this. A uh, couple different coaches, and everybody has had an influence on him. And I get the feeling that he's a sponge. He's a talker, but he's also a listener. I have no doubt that that Brady asks questions and then shuts up and listens and takes information in. And his uh, the role his brother, obviously his brothers played a role in this. His father. Uh, a lot mm-hmm. of people have, have, have played a role in in molding and building the present Brady Kachuk captain that you're seeing now. And uh, wouldn't he be so happy to – he'd be thrilled to lift a Stanley Cup here in Ottawa. He's made that statement a number of times that he wants to be here when things are going really well. He wants to be here for that, and I, I hope that's true. I, I really look forward to seeing the complete maturation and, and how the story ends for Brady Kachuk here with the Senators. Yeah, I mean, if he if he goes wire to wire, he might be Daniel Alfredson. You know, yeah. I think he's tracking to be that kind of player and maybe even more popular. If this guy spent his entire career here and scoring at the pace he's at, he could get all of Alfredson's records. We talk a lot about Ovechkin right now, and he's, you know, 30-some goals away from catching Gretzky. I envision 10 years in the future where we might be having the discussion about Brady Kachuk cap, you know, catching all of Alfie's uh, various records. It's amazing that, He's only been here, I think he's starting his, I want to say his seventh year now, and he already is, I think, sixth in uh, in club points or goals. I forget exactly. I think it was goals. Um, you know, and then and he, he's going to catch both Yashin and Marion Hosa by the end of this season. So he's on a great pace is my point. And uh, nothing but, I mean, if he, you know, he's, he's again, only, He's, he's got he's got four years left in this contract. So if he stays beyond this contract, we're going to be having these types of conversation of him being the greatest player in, in club history. That's a long way down the road. Mm. Get the get a couple more contracts signed in the meantime. Uh, point is, you know, Kachuk's on the right road right now. And, and the sad part is that I, I saw this stat out there and somebody wanted it fact checked. And I was going to go do it, and I didn't. But uh, the story is that you no, know, it's to, it's today's, today is November the third. This may be the latest day into a season that Brady Kachuk has ever been on a playoff team. They are presently no. in a playoff position. Yeah, something like that. It's it's some kind of stat about how into how late into a season is Brady Kachuk still been on a team that's actually in a playoff spot. Well, that's what? Up. Yeah. Did you see that one? It was on. It was floating around I, I, on social media. I wouldn't bet my life on it not being the case, but it is. It does seem awfully early. It doesn't it though? I don't know. Seems I know where really to look. Early. I got to go look. I, I promise. Okay, well, I, I think I have ten days before our next show, so I've got plenty of time to to do the work. <laughs> <laughs> to, to do the work required. It won't be ten days. <laughs> anyway, we won't, won't be ten days, and I, I'll say this: I don't think it would be much. You know, even if it proves to be an in, inaccurate stat. Yep. You know, when you think about it. It wouldn't be much further into November. Now, I, I, I would almost guarantee that the Sens in Brady Kachuk's time in Ottawa have never been in a playoff spot December first onward. Yeah, probably. So yeah. e- even that's even that's a horrific stat. But if it's if, if it's November third, yikes, that's not great. Um, moving on, Tyler Clevin had a nice sit down with Tyler Clevin. It was a 
it was neat too because it was a one on one in the dressing room, and so you got Hamannick to his left, and then Artem Zub in the middle, and then Clevin. Artem Zub has been you know on the sideline for a while, so he's not at practice, and so. As I was fiddling around with all my recording stuff, I sat down in, in Zub's stall, asked first. I'm, I, I wasn't sure if it was taboo or something like that to sit in an injured player's stall. So I asked first, and Hamannick said, yeah, absolutely. Someone should sit there. And so did you call him trail mix? While I'm fiddling. No, I did not. No, I certainly <laughs> did not. Uh, but that's a great nickname. That, that, that video with that little girl is absolutely hilarious and, uh, and endearing. Trail mix, Hamannick. But, uh, you know, while I was messing around with my recording stuff, Hamannick and, and Tyler Clevin are having a discussion about tying up and boxing out in front of the net and Clevin's asking questions and, uh, everything you, you hear about Hamannick being that great mentor going back to Jake Sanderson's rookie season. I think that's, uh, you know, if I had any doubt about it, that put it to rest because Hamannick genuinely, uh, you know, cares for these guys the 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 North Dakota army that he's got on defense now. These are all young guys. They all pick his brain, and uh, it was neat to see it up close. Like I wasn't even in the room, just listening to the two of them talk while I'm kind of messing with my recording equipment. Uh, so that was cool, and I uh, had a chance to talk to Tyler Clevin, and, and he's really, really off to a good start. Would you say not? Oh, yeah. He's not only he. How about JBD? Like as far yeah. as I'm concerned, the two of them are – they are the five six pair. When's the last time this team had had a bottom pair D that you just didn't worry about? Like they're doing just fine. The matchups are are, are working. They they play the right amount of minutes every night, and you know it's it's kind of sad. But Travis Hamannick, in a way, is uh, making himself obsolete as as these two guys improve. Because when Zub comes back, it's already been stated. When Zub gets back, he's going to play with Sanderson. And I don't see how you break up the five six. They're doing so well. I think Tramonic, uh, Travis Hamannick's out of the lineup the day the day Zub gets back, and and then kind of fights his works his way back in when somebody maybe needs a rest or or there's another injury. But I that the bottom pair has just been been awesome. I mean, no, they don't score, they don't produce a lot of points, they don't have to. Nobody's expecting that. They just do their job, shift in, shift out, and it's been it's been really good. It's been good to see it, and it's a it's a real plus as far as Steve Steos and the the management of the group or the organizational management group goes, because they declared that they believed that Clevin was ready, and so far it, it looks like they were right. Clevin's ready. JBD has come along, and that pair has been just super. Yeah, I I, I wouldn't. You know, I, I'm not going to paint them as Norris Trophy candidates or anything like that at this stage of the game. They've had their be. moments. No, they don't. They need to be minute eaters, minute munchers. But there, there have been some glitches that you'd expect from you know t- two defensemen so young. But uh, you know, there, there there might be a little of that university chemistry, right? That that uh, that that's helping. Uh, both of them went to North Dakota, and they may be. I mean, I'd like to see one of them with maybe a little more offensive push. But, I mean, that could come. We've talked a million times about how the defensive position is, you know, you just need more more time with them. And I love to see that people are talking in, you know, at least neutral terms, if not outright positive terms like you did, because the longer they can stay in there without getting that standard whipping boy, he's the, he's the defenseman, we don't, now, we don't like these guys now, and then they just get on them and, you, you, you know, the fan base, you know, they don't turn them into – you know, um, a messed up kid or anything like that as a, as a young prospect, but it doesn't help. And so the longer they can continue on with some level of success, wherever you believe that to be, um, the better it is for their confidence and, and, and they'll just get better and better as a result. So anyway, here's the uh, conversation that I had with Tyler Clevin talking a little bit about the fact that uh, he was about to play his 10th game in New York. And after a couple of seasons where he played nine games last year and eight games the year before, I uh, asked him about going from a temp to a full-timer who knows he's going to be in the lineup each and every night. What's the contrast like to come to the rink now knowing I'm a full-time NHL player versus the kind of temporary feel the last two years have had? Yeah, I think it's nice. Um, just being able to get closer with uh, the coaching staff and the guys has been really helpful. Um, working with the uh, coaches every day off the ice and, and then being able to talk to them on the ice too, like when we're in a game. Like that, that's a big help. Um, 
just knowing like, you know, if I make a mistake, I'm not going to get sent down right away. And, um, I, I don't know. I just got to keep playing my game and just play good hockey, pl- keep it simple and move the puck into the forwards hands. And I think that that's how I'm going to help the team win games. And, um, yeah, I'm thankful to be here. Good. Well, how would, one last one, how would you describe this group and the camaraderie they'd have together and being part of this team? Yeah, it's a pretty fun group. There's a lot of young guys, um, mixed with, uh, there's a lot of old guys on this team too, but I feel like we're all just like, we all have similar personalities and we all just like to obviously win games and, and have fun doing it. Um, there's always, uh, you know, a buzz around the room and, um, having fun, I guess. I don't know. That's kind of the main thing. And, um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to be here. And how do the old guys feel about you calling them old guys? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. They, I mean, they're not even old guys on the ice. They move so well and, um, they, they keep the locker room together and in hard times, if, uh, you know, we're down the game, they're always talking in the locker room. Some of the younger guys are speaking up to at times. So, um, I think it's a, you know, well-rounded team and, uh, yeah, I hope we go a long way this year. You're just chatting with Hamannick now. Sorry. I, I said last question and I've got follow-ups. You were just chatting with Travis Hamannick and he, he's just got this steady stream of, uh, of North Dakota guys uh, coming through, uh, he must be almost like a, you know, a second coach to you. Yeah. I mean, he's played 15 seasons and, uh, yeah, he'll be the first one to tell you that. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he, I mean, he's got so much experience, like, and he, and he brings it and he shows it to us every day too. So I know Sandy learned a lot from him over the last, uh, two years or whatever it is and played a lot of games with him and him and just a, you know, steady presence back there. And, um, I think that our game are, are pretty similar as well. So, um, you know, his experience, he just gives me tips at times and, um, we work on stuff after practice and like, he's always teaching me little things and, um, yeah, he's a great guy to be around. One of the funniest guys in the locker room for sure. And, um, yeah, he's, yeah, it's great for him to be here. Excellent. I'll take that from you now. Thank you so much. That was great. Really yeah. appreciate it. Tony. That was awesome. Thank you. So there is my conversation with Tyler Clevin and, uh, it goes without saying really, to suddenly be a guy that's in the lineup every night and you know that you let in, you know, let a guy beat you one on one is not necessarily an immediate ticket to Belleville. And with that comes a ton of confidence, right? Yeah. And, and it, it's a comfort level too, right? Like every other time that he's been here, it's been as a call up. He, in this case, this year, he started the season here. He's part of the team. He's one of the guys. He's not the interloper. He's not the guest when he gets a call up. He's part of the group, so that helps. He has bonds with these players; they're 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 friends, and and now he gets to be with them every day as an equal and not as a call up. So that helps his confidence. That helps his comfort level. And as you said, uh, you know, you make a mistake, it's not the end of your night. You're not going back to Belleville. He, he knows it's not temporary. Although on a certain level, it may well be temporary, but for the most part, he knows it's not temporary. He, he's he's here and should be here permanently and should feel and act and play that way. And, uh, and it shows. I love the guys on lefty so far this season. I know that people have knocked me for knocking Thomas Shabbat. He has driven me crazy on a couple of occasions this year, but generally speaking, he's been very good. And Nick Jensen has been everything advertised. If one of those guys though gets hurt, I would be wondering if Tyler Clevin is ready for that level of duty you know, from the one perspective, uh, that's not ideal depth-wise. But from Clevin's confidence standpoint, there's no one pushing him either. You know, there's no one in the minors right now where you say, oh, Clevin better watch out because player X there will come and take his job. That ain't happening. So they really need, you know, they've already got enough injuries going on right now. They definitely need everybody on that left side to stay healthy. Exactly. And uh, you, you bring up the injuries. It's nice to see uh, Ridley Gregg back. I'm I'm just yeah. I'm so frustrated with Shane Pinto now or not not I'm not frustrated with Shane Pinto I'm frustrated with the fact that you know he's injured and yet again it's affecting the the lineup and it's it's a shame that you don't get to see everybody play every night and you you have the stats on when Shane Pinto gets a point what their winning percentage is this team this team needs a guy like Shane Pinto and and the the, the stat I had was that all three of them Pinto Stutzla and Norris since uh, 
Since Pinto got here in April of 2021, the Senators have now played about 268 games and only 47 times have the three of them been in the lineup together. And that just, could you just imagine trying to, I, 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 Kind of makes you feel for Pierre Dorian, right? Like he 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 here's these three guys that he envisioned as centers one, two, three, and they have only played forty-seven games out of two hundred and sixty-eight over the course of the last three years. A six forty-nine win percentage in that time, but uh it, he's just not there often enough, and it just or he or Norris or whoever, it's been frustrating. And I, I I just I want Shane Pinto back in the lineup. I want a nice twenty game stretch with the real lineup on the ice every night. Yeah, the fact that they're six and five and they're without Shane Pinto, they're without Artem Zub, one of their top four guys, and they're without David Perron, who's probably targeted. I mean, he, he got off to a slow start before he had to step away for personal reasons, but the points were going to come. They always do for that guy. So to have a, the record they have with a funky schedule and the injuries they've had, I think that's uh, that's pretty impressive. And DJ Smith, you mentioned Pierre Dorian. DJ Smith would have loved yeah. to have the three centers in place. Pinto's numbers in particular are behind men, are behind men. Ryan Hindman, who uh, writes for the Hockey News, uh, he had a, a piece that he did on Shane Pinto's absence and how they play with and without him. They have a record with Pinto in the lineup of 76 and 58. I'll leave all the ties out of it. OTLs. Uh, ties. <laughs> OTLs. <laughs> yeah. Um, so again, 76, 58 with him. Without him, 46 and 65. And then when he gets a point in a game, the Sens are 42, 10, and 6. Like, that is that is big. Um, and that's part of your, I think, part of your stat as well as all three centers. Yeah. As everybody is slated properly. Uh, you got so much skill that the other team cannot accommodate in terms of their game planning. So you've got a, a, t- a really excellent s- scoring center on every one of the top lines. And now throw in Adam Gaudet as well. There you go. Holy moly. This is a... Uh, this is a team that is going to give other teams fits for this year. Let's get it rolling. Get everybody back and yep. healthy. Like uh, yeah. at least Pinto. Uh, well, Pinto and Zub. I'd be happy if Pinto and Zub get back. David Perron, uh, in a terrible situation. Give him all the time he needs. Get everything sorted out. Get comfortable again and and uh, ready to play. And whatever that is, that is. But in the meantime, I think if we can get Pinto back and Zub back here, the sooner the better. I look forward to seeing this team go on a nice little run. I just want to see a consistent lineup for a month would be really nice. Yeah. Well, everything's looking good at the moment. And uh, here's how your schedule, and it won't be 10 days until our next episode, okay. but here's our schedule. Uh, the Senators will be taking on the Buffalo Sabres in Buffalo this Tuesday night. That's a 7 o'clock face-off. Then it's Thursday night, November 7th. The Sens are back home hosting the New York Islanders. That two a 7 o'clock start. And then one that you got to think Linus Allmark has had circled on his calendar. The Senators are in Boston this coming Saturday night at seven o'clock. That'll be a special one, a weird one for him because, uh, you know, clearly loved playing in Boston and loved playing alongside Jeremy Swayman. I look forward to it. Uh, I'm I'm interested to see how he does against Boston and in Boston too, right? That'll be cool. Yeah. Uh, We'll get the old, uh, the video, Welcome back video tribute on Saturday night in Boston. I wonder if that game's going to be on an easily accessible channel, unlike uh, last night's game. Hopefully we'll be able to see that one. Did you watch last night's game? You must have. I did, Seattle. yeah. And what channel were you yeah. watching it on? Or do you want? Oh, like- don't make don't don't make me confess yeah, what, okay. how I watch the yeah. games these days, because okay. every time I try and watch it with my cable package, I get a big giant TSN logo that says not available in my region. And right. so I'm forced to do other things. Well, I, I, Seattle, the Seattle game was only on Sportsnet One, which if you okay. have a standard package, you don't get Sportsnet One. It's an extra seven bucks a month. You got to sign up to get Sportsnet One. The one that really threw right. me, though, was that CBC Ottawa was showing the Toronto game. CBC Montreal showed the Montreal game. CBC Toronto showed the Toronto game. But CBC Ottawa had the Toronto game on. If you wanted to watch the Senators last night, you needed Sportsnet 1. I'm surprised that everybody's not showing the Toronto Maple Leafs on every channel in every city in Canada. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's it's just the reality. Everybody uh, 
it pulls in big numbers. Big numbers equals big money. And uh, I know that even on the hockey news, if I mention the Toronto Maple Leafs somewhere in my story, those stories get most tons yeah. of views. It's crazy. So I understand why it happens. It just sucks if you're not a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, quite obviously. Uh, with that, we'll take our leave. Ladies and gentlemen, apologies for the delay between episodes, but we'll be back at you soon. And uh, do you want to do you want to commit to something right now? No, no, we're not good when we do that, Steve. <laughs> Ah, we can commit to something. Okay, well, they, we? they, they play Buffalo Tuesday night. Would you like to sit down and do this again Wednesday night? Done and done. In between games, in between the Sabres and Islanders games on uh, Wednesday will be our next episode on Wednesday night. So keep an eye out for that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Our website is sensnationhockey.com. Check out the hockey news as well. All kinds of great Sens articles there with a great team. That is thehockeynews.com slash Ottawa. Thank you for being with us, and we'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, sir. See you.